Can you hear me? There you go. No need for a microphone. Okay, guys, uh, I decided to do my presentation uh, comparing the original version of assemblage theory, mostly <coughs> as it exists in a thousand plateaus, although there are a few quotes in a couple of other books, with the more streamlined version that I developed, mostly because in a thousand plateaus you find something like, and actually you'll be taking my time here, I'm sure that I'm going to take 45 minutes. Um, when you look at a, at a thousand plateaus, there are at least seven different definitions of assemblage, which don't really mesh, at least not on, on the face of it, don't really mesh with one another. Now that is part of the way in which they wrote that book. I cannot imagine that when they got together and say, let's write Antaedipus, let's write a thousand plateaus, they decided, well, but let's not write anything until we reach consensus. Because if they had decided that, then they would have defeated the very purpose of putting two completely different authors writing a book, right? Consensus would have mean a certain homogenization, a certain uniformization. And so I'm in, imagining here, because I, I never met any of the two, uh, they decided to keep their differences alive so that they would continue to clash, continue to be a tension in that book. But for us, the readers, the fact that one wrote a definition here, the one that the other one wrote a definition there, means that you try to put all the definitions together and they don't seem to fit, although once you examine them carefully, they do fit. So I'm going to read most of the definitions, not one after the other, but one at a time, and then comment on them. Let me begin with what is, to me, the most important characteristic of an assemblage. What distinguishes an assemblage from a Hegelian totality. After all, the idea of wholes that are irreducible to their component parts already existed in the 19th century. Most German philosophers that belong to the philosophy of nature of the 19th century from Hegel to Schelling to many others, or were already fighting physics and its reductionist tendencies by asserting that they were organic wholes or seamless totalities that were not reducible. And they offered for a long time, the phenomenologists, the classical phenomenologists of the, of the 20th century completely accepted that notion of a totality. Uh, and it, so the notion of assemblage to begin with is to contrast itself to that other notion of a whole. Right? So what is the main difference there? The main difference is in, it can be captured by the distinction between relationships of exteriority versus relationships of interiority. Relationships of interiority are relationships that define the very identity of that which they relate. In other words, what, what, is, what becomes related does not preserve its identity, that it gets fused, and therefore relationships of interiority end up creating seamless totalities of the Hegelian type. Uh, the list switches to relationships of exteriority. Relationships of exteriority are, of course, the opposite as relationships that do not constitute the identity of what they relate. So they, 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 the things related, the components of an assemblage, <coughs> maintain a certain autonomy. They can be, in fact, unplugged from one assemblage, maintaining their identity, and then plugged into another assemblage. Right? So here is the first definition. This definition occurs in an interview between Deleuze and Claire Parnay, I believe it's called Dialogues. So I quote, What is an assemblage? It is a multiplicity which is made up of many heterogeneous terms and which establishes liaisons, relationships between them across ages, sexes, and reigns, different natures. Thus, the assemblage's only unity is that of a co-function. It, it is a symbiosis, 
a sympathy. It is never filiations, you know, like genealogical relationships in, uh, in families, which are important, but alliances. Not successions across generations, but, or, or lines of descent, but contagions, epidemics, the wind. Now, that all sounds very poetic, particularly the last part, the wind. But it makes perfect sense, and I'm going to try to explain at least one of them. Uh, first of all, the terminology we inherited from tradition, exteriority versus interiority, is a little misleading because it suggests something spatial, something interior to or something exterior to something. It has nothing to do with that. It simply is, does it define the identity of the relata? or does it respect the identity of the relata, of that which is being related? Right? So let me take one of the two, the, the two uh, examples here, filiations versus alliances. Now when you have a, a genealogical relationship, say in a family, the relationship brotherhood or fatherhood or motherhood does in fact determine the identity of the royal brother. In other words, a, two brothers or two sisters or a, or a mother and a daughter, their roles are intrinsically defined by the relationship, the family relationship that they are, uh, uh, that, that, that's the case, right? Since family relationships and their definitions vary from culture to culture, Every culture creates its own roles, and those roles have no existence outside of that relationship. You cannot be a brother outside of the relationship of brotherhood. So that is an example of a relationship of interiority, or to take the spatial aspect away of an intrinsic relationship. But a relationship between two tribes, each one with a different genealogical form of descent, with different heterogeneous, but that creates an alliance, an alliance for war, an alliance for the exchange of women, an alliance for any other reasons for the, the sharing of a particular piece of land, leaves the identity of the two tribes identical, and it just brings them together into a coalition, but that does, it's an extrinsic relationship that does not define their identity. So that's Characteristic number one of assemblages, exteriority or extrinsicness of relationships. If the particular whole you're examining, whether it's a social whole or a natural whole, does not display that characteristic, if all you can distinguish in the whole are aspects or moments, to use Marlou Ponty's uh, term, then you're not dealing with an assemblage. An assemblage, in short, has to be irreducible but analyzable. Now the second aspect of an assemblage is heterogeneity. Here I'm going to start the heterogeneity of the components. Here I'm going to read a quote from A Thousand Plateaus. It begins like this, quote, What the nomads invented was the man-animal weapon, the man-horse bow, assemblage. Through this assemblage of speed, the ages of metal are marked by innovation. The socketed bronze battle axe of the Hyksos and the iron sword of the Hittites have been compared to miniature atomic bombs. So here we have an assemblage, which is the warrior, the nomad warrior, so obviously from a human species, a horse, which is from an entirely different species, and a technical object, which is the bow, connected together in such a way as to form a whole, but clearly not a seamless totality, since the, the, the warrior can dismount, can put his bow, together, his bow aside, the bow would remain a bow, the dismounted warrior would remain a warrior, and the horse would remain a horse. Right? So they are related by extrinsicness. The question, though, now is what holds heterogeneities together? Because Hegel, in a book called The Science of Logic, 
where he introduces seamless totalities, had already said that a mere aggregation of heterogeneous elements, you know, that book ends with three chapters, one on physics, one on chemistry, one on biology, and, he, and Hegel argues that physics does not offer holes that, that have properties that are irreducible to their parts, which is very true for a lot of physics. Uh, and Hegel had already argued that the mere bringing together, the mere coexistence of heterogeneous elements doesn't form a larger whole that goes beyond the components. So we do need to answer what holds this, uh, what, what else in addition to heterogeneity do we need to bring them together into, into an irreducible whole? The, the concept used by Deleuze and Gattari is the concept of consistency. Let me read a quote here from a thousand plateaus. Quote, what holds together diverse components? This is a question of consistency. <coughs> the holding together of heterogeneous elements. At first, these elements constitute no more than a fuzzy set, no more than a part of this, a different page of the same the same essay, with, I mean, the same chapter, which is called the refrain. The problem of consistency concerns the manner in which the components of a territorial assemblages hold together. But it also concerns the manner in which different assemblages hold together with components of passage and relay. From the moment heterogeneity is hold together in an assemblage, a problem of consistency is posed in terms of coexistence or succession and both simultaneously. Now, the, cons the, 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 the end of quote. The word consistency, which by the way appears only in that chapter in the list, he never really develops it any farther, is a good one. It at least is telling us things need to be meshed together, you know, by complementarities, by overlappings, a, 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 before we can call that an assemblage. But a more modern, actually it's both, both older and newer word that I would prefer rather than consistency is the concept of emergence. Now, an emergent property is a property of a whole that, number one, does not exist in the parts, and number two, it is produced by the interactions between the parts. The concept of emergence, not the word itself, but the concept, was introduced into the Western world by chemists in the late 1700s. Chemists were, the first, uh, chemists were obviously always under pressure by physicists to reduce the substances they, they, they dealt with, the compounds they dealt with, to their, through the elements are fuels. But if you take water and put it on the fire, it puts out the fire. It has exactly the opposite properties of its component. So chemists realize that there are emerging properties. That once you put two, sub two elementary substances together, like oxygen and hydrogen, and you get water, you get a complete new substance. A substance that didn't exist prior to the synthesis. But nevertheless, it's a property, it's a, it's a substance that can be reanalyzed into oxygen and hydrogen. It's not mysterious. Now, the first, um, uh, the first uh, generation of emergentists, the, pr the first philosopher who brought this, or these ideas into philosophy is John Stuart Mill. In the middle of the 19th century, he didn't use the word emergence, but he used the example of water. And then people commenting on John Stuart Mill, uh, several generations, including John Alexander, who was perhaps the most famous, constitute the first generation of emergentists and they got just about everything right except for one thing. They, they say emergent properties, the reason why emergent properties are, cannot be explained by physics and chemistry and so on is because they are unexplainable. They are mysterious. Alexander put it this way, he said, we have to accept them with natural piety. Which of course it made a lot of analytical philosophers of science after that very suspicious of the concept of emergence because it's 
If it's something that's inherently unexplainable, well, then it is something that's mystified. Right? But in the last few decades, we have uh, we, there has been a new, a, a renewed interest in the concept of emergence, in which that whole it is unexplainable thing has been thrown away. The whole, the, almost the entire work of the first generation of emergences has been thrown away, and now it is explainable. We need to always come up with a, with a way of explaining how the interactions between the parts generate the whole. In the particular case of water, how the bonding of, in a particular way of oxygen and hydrogen and how the, the angle they make in their bonding and the distances between the bonds is what actually, and the fact that there's two, two hydrogens on either side makes it a bipolar molecule, is what explains that water is a solvent uh, and so on and so forth. So now we don't have to, you know, we, we can accept emergent properties, irreducible properties, uh, without having to accept that they are mystical or that we have to accept them with natural piety or with any kind of piety for that matter, right? So this gives us a minimal <coughs> definition of an assemblage. An assemblage is a whole that is both irreducible because it has emergent properties, because it has consistency, but analyzable. The second part is what distinguishes it from Hegelian totalities, which are not analyzable. In a Hegelian totality, you cannot distinguish components, all you can distinguish is aspects. And so that is what's new, in, at least in relationship to what Hegel and Schelling and others had done in the 19th century. But then comes the official definition of assemblage. I call it the official definition because it occurs twice, it's the only one that occurs twice in a thousand plateaus. It occurs both in the main text and then at the end when they give that glossary a, 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 a kind of organized alphabetically, which you would think, well, this is their, their final version or something like that. But of course, as you will see, it doesn't fit at all. It doesn't mention exteriority, it doesn't mention consistency, so it has to be taken together with the others. But nevertheless, I'm going to read it, because as far as I'm concerned, it is the official definition. And here it goes. Quote, We may draw some general conclusions on the nature of assemblages from the previous discussion. On a first horizontal axis, now they are talking as if it was a space with axis. On a first horizontal axis, an assemblage comprises two segments, one of content and another one of expression. Then, on a vertical axis, the assemblage has both territorial sides and re -terri or re territorialized sides, which stabilize it, and cutting edges of deterritorialization which carry it away. <coughs> now let me, I have to explain every single term here because just like that, it sounds like just a, a vomit of jargon, right? <laughs> Let's begin with the word segment. What, what is that supposed to be? Well, in the Delusian ontology, the creation of the world, you might say this is kind of like a mythological part of the list. The creation of the world is, it begins with a, a, a virtual continuum that contains all the possibilities of what can be created and more. And creation, the creation of actual things, is a progressive segmentation of that continuum. You know, that to create discrete entities, discrete animals, discrete plants, discrete species, discrete organizations, discrete communities, discrete cities, they have now boundaries, right? Uh, Deterritorialization, on the other hand, is that which fuzzy is or makes those boundaries fuzzy and absolute deterritorialization is what takes you back to that continuum, right? Now I could now explain all of this mathematically, which can perfectly very well be explained. For instance, topology uh, is a mostly continuous uh, geometry and the way you get from topology to Euclidean geometry, Euclidean geometry of course being completely discontinuous, completely segmented into different figures and so on, is a, is a process of uh, progressive differentiation, 
progressive segmentation, progressive metrization. All of this just to explain the word segment, because the first time I read that definition, segments, well, what are segments? Well, that's what they call anything actual, any discrete entity. So we can call them components, right? I'm going to leave for, a, for a, a, a farther comment what is content and expression. Let me go to the second part, territorialization and deterritorialization. The first place, territorialization means, as, as we saw in the quote, something that stabilizes the assemblage, which in the case of assemblages that have a spatial component, such as a community that has boundaries, a city that has boundaries, a, uh, an organization that has boundaries, a person who has boundaries, means the, the, the extent to which those boundaries are well defined, the state, the, sta the, state, the, uh, the state to which those boundaries are stable, and therefore define a relatively enduring identity. But despite the spatial connotations of the word territorialization, we should also consider that what binds us to an identity is a function. For instance, the heart, in addition to having its very definite spatial boundaries, it also has a very special function, pumping blood throughout the, the body. And so being attached to a particular function, much like attached to a particular spatial boundary, is territorialization. And therefore, deterritorialization is the breaking up of those boundaries, the softening of those boundaries, the detachment of an assemblage or a component of an assemblage from a particular function and it's becoming another spatial entity. It's becoming another function. So territorialization and deterritorialization go together, one pushing in one direction, a stability of identity, well definition of the identity of the assemblage, or on the contrary, fuzzing up the identity of the assemblage so that it now is on its way to becoming perhaps another assemblage. So, those are the terms. Now, there's fi a final term in this definition that needs to be explained. Why axis? You know, so on one axis, content and expression. On the other axis, territorialization, deterritorialization. At that point, he is using a kind of spatial metaphor, an abstract space defined by its coordinates. But another way which in mathematics is equivalent to defining things by axis is to defining things by parameters. Let me explain what the term means. A parameter is basically a knob, a knob that you change and can have different values. Right? In a typical mathematical model, there are variables and there are parameters. The variables typically refer to the properties of the system that you're studying, this particular chemical substance, this rat that's being examined by psychologists that are training it to do something. And so, for instance, the property temperature would refer, in this case, to the internal temperature of the rat, to the internal temperature of the substance. A parameter is the variables that define, the properties that define the environment of the substance, of the rat, of the electrical experiment, whatever, phenomenon, whatever, the environment of the phenomenon. Right? So temperature can appear as a variable, the internal temperature of the phenomenon, and as a parameter, the temperature of the environment of the phenomenon. Right? So a parameter normally in, in, in science is kept fixed because you want to study the experiment over and over and over again with fixed environmental conditions so that other scientists can then uh, replicate the effect by fixing the environmental conditions. But a parameter can also be varied. And when a parameter is varied, for instance, the parameter temperature, imagine that you have a glass of water with a certain temperature inside, that is, that is a variable. And you have a parameter that also controls temperature. That parameter, as it turns to, say, 100 degrees centigrade, is going to force now the water to become vapor. If you put, push the parameter on the other direction so that it reaches zero degrees temperature, it makes the water in the, in the glass freeze. Right? So parameters are normally kept constant, but if you vary them, you discover that they have critical thresholds at which things change in nature. Not in chemical nature in this case, but in physical nature. 
Now that Deleuze and Gattari are thinking along those lines comes from this quote. He says, this, this is Deleuze again in that uh, interview with Claire Parnett. What must be compared, quote, what must be compared in each case are the movements of deterritorialization and the processes of re-territorialization which appear in an assemblage. Well, what do they mean, these wars that Felix invents to make them into variable coefficients? Now, the word variable coefficient is synonymous with parameter, right? A coefficient is a constant in a mathematical model, just like a parameter is, but if you add the, the word variable to it, it means it's a parameter, it's a knob that you can change. Right? So I decided to say, forget about the axis, which most people don't understand what the hell the axis is supposed to be, and let's take the concept and add knobs to it. And just to make it even more visual. The concept of, of assemblage now comes with knobs that you can move. One of the knobs is called territorialization. Now, a second change that I made is the following. Throughout A Thousand Plateaus, Deleuze and Gattari contrast two types of emergent holes, or two types of holes held by consistency. Strata and assemblages. And they treat them as if they were two entirely different things. Right? The main difference between the two is that Strata, in addition to having the parameter territorialization, deterritorialization, the identity of a stratum is also determined by a second variable, a second parameter, a second axis, a second articulation, as they, as they call it, that they call coding. And not to get too much into the details of what coding is, it roughly refers to the role which DNA, or genetic materials, and in the case of humans, language, that is, in the case in which two codes, genetic codes, linguistic codes, the role that those codes have in fixing the identity of a whole, in fixing the identity of an ensemble, whether the ensemble is a stratum or is a, uh, uh, an assemblage. That is an important thing, because again, we are talking about these parameters do impinge on the stability of the identity, the, the, the enduring part of an assemblage. And so, in this particular version, the difference between a strata and assemblage is that an assemblage does not have that second parameter, or if you want to put it that way, in which that parameter has been taken to zero. Here's a quote to support, to support that. As, and, I'm, and I'm quoting now from A Thousand Plateaus. Assemblages are already different from strata. They are produced in the strata, but operate in zones where milieus have become decoded. In other words, where the parameter coding has been turned to zero or to very low, right? They begin by extracting a territory from the milieus. The territory is made of decoded fragments of all kinds which are borrowed from the milieus but which then assume the value of properties. So at this point I began to think, well, if the only difference between strata and assemblages is that assemblages are just like strata, only with one of the two parameters low, why don't we just make him one entity? Right? Why don't we just have one word, the word assemblage, and then the, 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 just like the, the value of the parameter determines whether this is ice or is liquid water or is vapor, why don't we just do it so that the, value, the range of parameters in which we are operating determines whether a particular ensemble, to use a neutral word, is of the strata type, of the assemblage type, or of all the type. Right? That way we get rid of an opposition. 
Because if, if we continue to speak of assemblage and strata, there's always going to be the critics that are going to be saying, oh, that's a dichotomy. And dichotomies are a bad thing. And that's an opposition. Whereas if we make um, the strata state and the assemblage state a function of the, of the parameters and their, their, and their values, then just like ice, water, and vapor, the strata and assemblages in the original sense become phases, become like the gas phase or the solid phase, become transformable into one another. Now Deleuze and Gattari constantly, whenever they said these oppositions, rhizome, tree, uh, striated spaces versus smooth spaces, Throughout the book, they place oppositions like that. But halfway through the chapter, they say, but this is not an opposition. Because uh, the rhizomes can become uh, uh, trees, and trees can become rhizomes. But if you're going to do that, then don't present it as an opposition to begin with. Make them be something transformable into one another in a rigorous way. And the rigorous way is by moving the knob territorialization and moving the knob uh, coding and then getting something that's a stratum, something that's an assemblage. In uh, uh, to uh, justify my choice of getting rid of the word strata or getting rid of the opposition, I'm going to read another quote. The opposition between strata and assemblages is entirely relative. Just as milieus swing between a stratum state and a movement of this stratification, assemblages swing between a territorial closure that tends to restratify them and a deterritorializing movement that, on the contrary, connects them with the cosmos. Right there, they are basically saying what I'm saying. Right? The opposition we wanted was not strata assemblages, the opposition we wanted was actual entities and the plane of consistency, the plane of immanence, the plane of exteriority, right? And assemblages are somewhere in the middle. Well, but if that is going to be the case, we can capture that much better with ranges for the parameter values, different combinations of the parameter values. That way, that way we get one concept with knobs. I understand that the idea of a concept with knobs can be relatively new, but I love it. Because it means that it is a concept that you can that is not just fixed. It's a concept that comes already equipped with knobs that you can turn, and as you turn them, the referent of the concept changes. Okay, let me just get then get back to you. so. Just a second here. Okay. Now. Let's go back to the components of the assemblage. I said before that the, the components of the assemblage are segments of content and expression. Those two terms they take them from a Danish uh, linguist, Jem, Jemsle, I, I believe that I can't really pronounce Danish or any other language for that matter. Uh, and Every time they use that opposition continent expression, they have to explain, oh, but we're not talking about linguistics. This is not signifier and signify. They have to add like a half a paragraph to, to, to explain to us that this is not linguistic. But if we have to add half a paragraph every time we use content and expression, we might as well shoot ourselves, right? So why don't we just translate it into something else? Instead of segments, let's use the word components, which is what they meant, and say material components, or components playing a material role, that way the definition would be functional, and components playing an expressive role. So let me just see if I... Uh... Now, in, because they <coughs> try to keep the two quite separate, they actually sometimes give different, uh, different adjectives to the assemblage to differentiate the two. For instance, in, the, in this particular case, when they are talking about human organizations, they say, a community or organization is on one hand a machinic assemblage of bodies, that, is, that would be the content, that would be the material components, 
a machinic assemblage of bodies, an intermingling of bodies reacting to one another. And on the other hand, it is a collective assemblage of enunciation, of expression, of acts and statements, of incorporeal transformations attributed to bodies. In this case, in this particular case, incorporeal transformation simply means speech acts, right, as studied by Austin. When I commit myself by saying, yes, I promise I will take care of your kids tomorrow, and you live in a tightly knit community where your actions matter and where you're breaking a promise is known to everybody, the moment you finish the phrase, I promise that, you have been transformed from an uncommitted neighbor to a committed neighbor, right? But it's an incorporeal transformation because sort of like a judge saying, I declare you guilty. Right before he said that, the prisoner was in limbo, probably guilty, probably innocent, but after the, the, the judge says guilty, there's a, an incorporeal transformation. That's obviously an expressive component of the assemblage. Let me continue the quote. We may take the word body in its broadest sense, the body of the property, the body of the victim, the body of the convict, the body of the prison. But the transformation of the accused into a convict is a pure instantaneous act or incorporeal attribute that is the expressed of the judge's sentence. Peace and war are states of intermingles, intermingles of very different kinds of bodies, of weapons, of soldiers, of bombs, of the, 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 the battlefield itself, but the declaration of a general mobilization expresses an instantaneous and incorporeal transformation of bodies. So it's pretty clear he's distinguishing the material of a war or a commitment to incarcerate you because you've been declared guilty. He's talking about material components and expressive components. The problem is the examples they are giving right now don't generalize. Certainly, they don't generalize to the, to the example of the warrior mounted on his horse with his bow. Right. I, I wonder what is the collective enunciation of that one particular guy, you know, since first of all it's just one person and there are no speech acts. Right. So the problem with the definitions they give in different chapters is that they are adapted to the chapter in which they occur and they don't really seem to care about making it something that is smooth across the chapter. So, but we can do that. Now, my way of doing it is this. First of all, why talking about the components, the material components of an assemblage as bodies and technical objects, when bodies and technical objects are assemblages? or at least strata. Right? They, do, they do speak of the human body, the organism, as one of the strata that binds us, the other two being signifiance and signification, I mean signifiance and subjectification. So we are stratified, we are bound to our actual form by our bodies. So a body is a stratum, but as we just saw, a stratum is just an assemblage which has a very high degree of coding, so a body is an assemblage. So instead of multiplying terms, an assemblage, then you have bodies, you have technical objects, you have acts of expression, why don't we just talk of assemblages of assemblages? Every assemblage is made out of assemblages. And in turn, it can become part of weapons like swords and sabers. The saber implies the actualization of a first singularity namely the melting of the iron at high temperature, then a second singularity, the successive decarbonations, which you probably do by hammering on, on, the, on the weapon, we will call an assemblage, and here's another definition that doesn't seem to fit with the other ones at all, right? we will call an assemblage every constellation of singularities and traits deducted from the flow, deducted from the continuum, segmented from the continuum, selected, organized, stratified in such a way as to converge artificially or naturally. An assemblage is in a sense a veritable invention. 
So here you uh, have an example of technical objects being defined as assemblage in one chapter, whereas in the other chapter they are defined as the content of the assemblage, one of the, the segments of content. It's going to be very, very confusing, and I think we, we can greatly simplify the theory and greatly unify the different definitions if we treat swords, rifles, grenades, any other kind of weapon, in this particular, just to stick to this particular case, as themselves assemblages, and therefore assemblages with their own knobs. So that they can go deterritorializations when you turn the knob in this direction, they can go decodings when you turn the knob in that direction, independently of the, of the hole to which they belong, which has its own knobs, has its own ways of losing definition in its boundaries, has, a, has its own way of detaching itself from its function. Now, they, they, let me just uh, uh, say another quote which shows you that they are talking about this way. In other words, that they do consider that the components of an assemblage can themselves be deterritorialized or with a knob, regardless of the overall assemblage they belong to. And here's the quote. Maximum deterritorialization sometimes starts from a trait of content, from a segment of content, from a material component, and sometimes from a trait of expression, from a, from a segment of expression, from an expressive component. Right? That trait is said to be deterritorializing in relationship to the other traits, precisely because it diagrams, it carries it off, raises it to its own power. The most deterritorialized element, the most deterritorialized component, causes the other components to cross a threshold, enabling a conjunction of the respective deterritorializations, a shared acceleration. That, 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 that uh, 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 paragraph would not make sense if we treat bodies and technical objects as if they were different from assemblages. But it makes perfect sense if, if an assemblage is made out of assemblages, because each one of those components has its own knobs, and so one of the components can have the, knob, the territorialization knob turned all the way up, and by that it begins affecting the other components that it interacts with, forcing now the entire assemblage to go a deterritorialization. So I'm here trying to fix inconsistencies which, as I said, were inevitable in this book because when they got together, as I said at the beginning, they could not possibly say, okay, Felix, uh, the moment we reach consensus on something, we are going to write that. Right? Because that would have defeated the whole idea of bringing heterogeneities together. They wanted that book to be an assemblage an assemblage of Felix and Jill, right? And the only way you can have that is if each one had complete liberty to write whatever they wanted, and you, one couldn't really completely disagree with the other, and so they must have written it in a very experimental way, but in ways that, that did not necessitate consensus. That makes it very experimental and very open, and perhaps that is the way they reach so many different areas at once, but for the same reason, for the reader, it makes it very hard to try to put all the different definitions which were written in different times and without regard to the other chapters together, right? This way we can, we can begin bringing them together. Now another problem with not considering assemblages of assemblages is that the Lewis and Gattari tend to think of a larger assemblage, now imagine the assemblage formed by the nomad, uh, the horse and the bow, or in the case of Greek or Roman armies, uh, the assemblage formed by an infantry soldier, its armor and its pike or its sword, right? That's an assemblage of heterogeneities, right? But then they, of course, can become part of a larger assemblage, an army. An army of nomads, an army of uh, 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 sedentary soldiers. And the Lewis and Gattari, the moment they move to the next scale, to the next assemblage, 
they don't call it an assemblage, they call it the conditions necessary for the intermediate level assemblage to have come together. Let me read. The human horse bow assemble, ensemble forms a nomadic war machine under the conditions of the step. The Greek foot soldier, together with his weapons, constitute, a, constitute an assemblage under the conditions of the phalanx. I, you know, I, I completely disagree with that. A phalanx is an assemblage. A phalanx is an assemblage, eight by eight, of infantry soldiers. When you read the history of the phalanx in modern times, it becomes progressively flattened. Maurice of Nassau, which is a, 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 a Dutch commander, made it three men deep instead of eight men deep, as they were in Greek and, and, and Roman phalanxes. Three men deep, but now with muskets. Uh, Napoleon reduced it to one man deep. They still fought as a phalanx. They fought in tight formations, but now a one man deep phalanx can deploy from, from line to column to march, to line to fire, to column to march. And so a phalanx is an assemblage with its own territorialization, its own coding parameters. It's not just a condition. And that, and that brings me to what is perhaps the greatest disagreement between me and Deleuze and Gattari, other than the fact that they remain Marxists until the end of their lives, and I, as a Latin American, began as a Marxist. I mean, there are no Latin American intellectuals that I know that are not Marxists. In Mexico and the rest of Latin America, there is no right-wing intellectuals. Most right-wingers are pretty much retarded. <laughs> and so if you're an intellectual, you are a Marxist. So when I arrived in New York City, I was a Marxist with my Che Guevara t-shirt and then my fist really clenched very powerfully and, and I wanted to join the cause and the struggle and, and so on. Until I read Fernand Rodel, who is all about assemblages even though he doesn't use the word assemblage. And, 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 and tells us there is, so the, 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 any particular country is made out of many levels of assemblages, he calls it sets of sets, but we can change that to assemblages of assemblages. Right? So the Lutheran Qatari, on the other hand, pre pre precisely because they maintain a very simple social ontology, they, they, in the three times where they enumerate their ontology, one occurs in the Claire Parnett interview and twice in A Thousand Plateaus, their ontology, their social ontology is this, the individual, the group, and the social field, which they also call the socius in, in anti-Oedipus, which basically means society as a whole. Now, with that kind of ontology, the individual, you know, it's only a tiny little better than the individual versus society, which is the one that we've been dealing with for like 200 years, right? With economists picking the, at least microeconomics speaking the individual, Durkheim and other macroeconomists speaking society as a whole, now they are adding groups in the middle, and that's supposed to be like a big improvement. I completely disagree with that, right? I think that once we understand that when we are always dealing with assemblages of assemblages, I take human beings as being one assemblage, which is partly organic, partly cultural. We are, we are heterogeneous. Uh, uh, our minds are heterogeneous entities, our bodies are heterogeneous entities. They themselves begin, as they begin interacting, they can form communities, which is very different than groups, like, such as the communities that inhabit a small town and that have properties and capacities of emergent properties of their own. For instance, a community as a whole can store the reputations of its members can't, but because gossip travels very, very fast in a tightly knit community, and therefore when you break a promise, when you don't reciprocate a favor, when you say a lie, everybody knows that you said a lie, everybody knows that you don't pay back your favors, everybody knows that, uh, uh, that you don't have honor, and if you, if you insist in continuing doing it, you insist in lying, you insist in not paying back your bets, the community can punish you as a whole, via ridicule and ostracism. Right? So, ridicule, 
The capacity to punish the violation of local norms and the capacity to store reputations belongs to the assemblage, which is the community. But then a community, now as an emergent whole, as an assemblage with its own properties and its own parameters, the territorialization parameter, for instance, here would be something like social mobility. The more social mobility there are, the less the, the offspring of that community live in the community they move away to the city or move away to a larger community instead of staying in their community because there's social mobility, the less territorialized the community is. The community itself can now enter into an even larger assemblage, for instance, those we call social justice movements, such as the workers' movements of the 19th century, the civil rights movements of the, of the 60s and prior to that, the women's movement, which are made out of many communities in alliance, right? A coalition of many communities, which in turn has its own emergent properties and is irreducible to any single community. So here we're talking about then a multi-layer social ontology in which one set of assemblages forms another assemblages and many of those form another assemblage. The same thing with institutional organizations like hospitals, schools, uh, barracks, uh, factories, uh, prisons, right, and many others, the universities, right. Any or most institutional organizations have an authority structure, which means that speech acts like commands flow downwards. The boss of the organization gives commands to the next layer, which then flow all the way to the people who will do it and reports as to the, what happened when you when you actually follow the commands flow upwards. Right? So it's very different than communities. It's an entirely different thing and certainly not something that we can define by the word group, even though it is an aggrupation of people. Right? Now, an organization is an assemblage. And one of its emerging properties is the legitimacy of its authority. Legitimacy, as we know from Max Weber, can come from a different variety of sources. A charismatic leader, a tradition, such as the traditions that maintain the Pope as the head of the Vatican or the tradition that maintain Queen Elizabeth as the head of government in, 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 in Britain. Uh, and legitimacy is a property of the organization as a whole, right? as an assemblage. But of course, because an assemblage has parameters, legitimacy is a variable. A, a, a particular organization can lose legitimacy and its function can become fuzzier. Think of the organization at the United States called FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Organization, which 12 years ago, when Hurricane Katrina hit in New Orleans, entirely failed to do its job, right? Katrina hit on a Sunday night. By Monday, FEMA should have showed up with water, with food, with tents, FEMA doesn't show up on Monday, FEMA doesn't show up on Tuesday, FEMA, FEMA doesn't show up on Wednesday, FEMA showed up on Friday, right? And after that, in the eyes of most people and in the eyes of most other government organizations, FEMA's legitimacy decreased. In fact, we had almost no legitimacy until the next hurricane, uh, Hurricane Sandy, hit New Jersey and parts of New York. FEMA responded correctly and its legitimacy went up which means that it is a variable, and therefore we can, we can treat it as a parameter. Right? Deleuze and Gattari do consider organizations, I just mentioned prison, they, they talk about prison, they mentioned the courthouse, but they never really incorporate it into a well-defined ontology. Right? Now, the organizations, of course, once they are assembled, and once they acquire stability by territorialization, can therefore part of larger assemblages. Think of industrial networks. So think of, for instance, General Motors and all the organizations that are its suppliers. The, the, the organizations that supply the glass for its windshield, the, the organizations that supply partly assembled motor components, the organization that supplies the aluminum for the bodies, the organization that supplies the leather for the, for the seats, and so on and so forth. General Motors must have something like 100, 150 different suppliers, each one a different organization with a different authority structure. And then General Motors depends on car dealerships owned by private 
entrepreneurs to distribute its products. General Motors doesn't own its car dealership. They are the, it just network to them. Right? And so the entire industrial network that makes that car production possible now is an assemblage of organizations right? with its own territorialization parameter, with its own coding parameter, uh, capable of changes regardless of whether the components actually change. But again, the Luz and Gattari don't really talk about that. And we can go farther up. Right? Once you have many communities and many organizations inhabiting the same place, you have a city. A city as an assemblage. An assemblage not only of its infrastructure, its wall, its uh, uh, water infrastructure, its electricity infrastructure, its, 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 uh, its roads and streets, its buildings, but also of the communities that inhabit those residential buildings, of the organizations that inhabit the, 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 the uh, non-commercial, the commercial buildings. Uh, a city, in turn, we, did, we know this since uh, the geographer uh, Chris Thaler showed the patterns formed in Europe by central place hierarchies uh, <coughs> form urban regions you know, in which there's a, a larger pro, a regional capital, such as, such as Pittsburgh and Philadelphia in, 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 in Pennsylvania, two entirely different a, a, a urban regions with a regional capital, attached to several smaller towns with which they interact a lot. The region as a whole has its own emergent properties, right? I, I, can, I cannot right now go into Crystal Air's theory right now, but uh, 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 he goes into detail as to what the properties, the emerging properties of a central place hierarchy are. Many of those urban regions now form a larger assemblage, an assemblage which in Europe is called a province, which in the United States is called a state, in this case, uh, a, a Pennsylvania, which are different from other, you know, Pennsylvania is very different from Utah, which is very different from California, which is very different from New York, New York the state, right? Each one with its own regional culture. And then those provinces the, stitched together form the largest assemblage, at least the one, the largest that I'm going to be considering right now, which is a country, right? In many cases, in the case of Europe, for instance, the stitching together was done first by matrimonial links, a king would marry a princess from another, another kingdom, another province, uh, and then be a war to solidify the, the marriage, to solidify the links and make him finally build a unified country. I cannot really think of many unified countries, including China, including India, including many places in Europe, including the United States, that did not come together through war or, because in the case of the United States, the 13 original colonies more or less amicably came together, that did not prevent secession, that the deterritorialization by secession via a civil war. But regardless of the details, here we have a Brodellian ontology. Persons that form communities and organizations, that form social justice movements, and, uh, yeah, I'm about to finish. I'm, I'm almost done. Uh, <laughs> that form industrial networks, then form cities, urban regions, provinces, countries, and of course now in the age of globalization, and if we believe in things like contract TF wave and so on, even larger entities. The, the EU itself is in fact a larger entity because it's an assemblage of countries. The problem with the EU is that we don't really know for how long it's going to last. You know, considering Brexit and considering that there are pressures for its deterritorialization and it's coming apart, but nevertheless, there's no reason to put an upper limit on the level as to what assemblages can be. Right? So, it is that last change, changing the social ontology, which Deleuze and Gattari didn't really pay that much attention to, that is the most important one, the most important difference between their work and my work. All of the other changes that I mentioned before are pretty much cosmetic, are pretty much, not cosmetic, but 
uh, designed to make the concept more intuitive and more easy to understand, more easy to teach. But we could disregard all of those as being merely decorations or, or uh, conveniences. But this last change, the change from a three-layer ontology, the individual, the group, society as a whole, to a multi-layer ontology which has been wi widely documented by Fernando Dale with all the data that you can possibly want to have, which allows us to then study deterritorializations and decodings at the level at which they belong. Sometimes it is the person that becomes deterritorialized because it it went through a, a psychiatric hospital and the mind became territorialized into a delirium. Or it is the community that becomes territorialized by an increase in social mobility. Or it is the organization that became territorialized because the, the speed at which innovation uh, uh, was going was too fast and the organization had to break itself up into several ones. Or the, the deterritorialization can occur at the level of a city. When, for instance, medieval cities lost their walls and now their limits and, and, and their suburbs acquire the same difference in land uses, residential, governmental, uh, 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 industrial, uh, entertainment, shopping, I mean, shopping centers and so on that the central city has. Today, cities do not really have a, 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 a nice territorialized border, they blend with the suburbs, which are all almost like peripheral cities. We can now talk about the territorialization and territorialization, or coding and decoding, at a specific scale. Instead of talking about the deterritorialization of society, which doesn't make any sense whatsoever. You can speak of the deterritorialization of a country, but not of society as a whole, because society as a whole, as, I, as far as I can tell, doesn't exist. Thank you very much.